Have you ever had a roommate who disrupts your entire life? Not simply the sort that leaves dirty dishes in the sink or uses all of the hot water, but the roommate with the dark, evil side you're constantly afraid of, who never pays rent, signs a lease, or maybe is a serial con artist, or worse, a roommate who is a serial killer? Today we will discuss some of the most insane roommate situations that have been reported. From clogged toilets to filthy scams to backyard funerals, these real-life cases investigate the complexities of relationships between strangers and the dynamics of human nature. So, lock the door, subscribe to the channel, hit that like button, and run a background check on your roommates, and let's get into the video. Judy, a now-retired social worker, fell upon Dorothea Puente's boarding house in Sacramento, California, in 1988 while assisting Alvaro Bert Gonzalez Montoya, a man with mental illness, in finding a place to live. Dorothea Puente, who died in 2011, was a serial murderer who resembled a grandmother and was a pillar in her community in 1988. She appeared very nice, we were impressed, we were thinking, she is nice. Judy recounted in the Netflix documentary that she had a box of kittens and small milk bottles to feed and care for them. Puente told Judy that she was independently wealthy and enjoyed assisting others. Puente's boarding home was highly recommended, and Bert appeared to be in good care. The landlady had a reputation for taking in boarders with mental illnesses or alcoholism and providing a secure place to remain, while they paid her rent with their social security checks. Dorothea Puente was loved by her community and local politicians. Detective John Cabrera of the Sacramento Police Department says in the film, she would donate to local organizations and give them bags of clothing. She welcomed all of these individuals and treated her neighbors with respect. She was handing out free food to the community. Judy was startled when she checked up on Bert after a few months, and Puente told her an unbelievable story about his trip to Mexico. When Judy followed up with John Sharp, another boarder in the house, and inquired if anything was wrong, he said, Yeah, something is wrong here. She's, she's been digging a lot of holes. When you first look at her, you think, this could be my grandmother. Puente was born Dorothea Helen Gray on January 9, 1929, in Redlands, California, to Trudy May and Jesse James Gray. Her parents were both drinkers, and her father often threatened to take his own life in front of his children. Her father died of TB in 1937, and her mother, a sex worker, lost custody of her children in 1938, shortly before dying in a motorcycle accident. Puente and her siblings were eventually moved to an orphanage where she was assaulted. Gray's first marriage occurred at 16 in 1945 to a soldier named Fred McFall. They had two daughters between 1946 and 1948. McFall abandoned her in late 1948. Puente was arrested in Riverside in the spring of 1948 after allegedly purchasing women's accessories using fraudulent checks. She pleaded guilty to two charges of forgery and received four months in prison and three years probation. Six months after being released, she fled Riverside. Puente's life was a mess. She created it for herself and she couldn't live an everyday life. In 1952, Puente married merchant seaman Axel Bren Johansson in San Francisco. She bore a fake identity as Taya Singoala Nayarda, a Muslim lady of Egyptian and Israeli origin. They had a rough marriage. Puente took advantage of Johansson's frequent maritime tours by inviting guys to their house and gambling away his money. Gray was arrested in 1960 for using an accounting business as a front for a brothel in Sacramento. She was found guilty and sentenced to 90 days in the Sacramento County Jail. Johansson was a good man, and she was admitted to DeWitt State Hospital in 1961. There, physicians identified her as a pathological liar with an unstable disposition. Puente and Johansson divorced in 1966, although she continued to use Johansson's name for some time after their divorce. Following her third divorce, Puente focused on maintaining a boarding home on the south side of F Street between 14th and 15th Street. She established herself as a trustworthy community resource for alcoholics, homeless people, and mentally ill people by organizing Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and supporting people in applying for social security benefits. She transformed her public image into that of a respectable older woman by wearing antique attire, huge granny glasses, and allowing her hair to gray. 
Suspicions about Puente initially surfaced in 1988, when Judy, an outreach counselor with Volunteers of America, realized 52-year-old Alvaro Montoya, whom she had put at Puente's home, had gone missing. She notified the police who went to the residence and were met with the same response. Alvaro went home for the holidays, but John slipped them a note. She's making me lie for her. The police returned and searched the property but discovered nothing, so they requested permission to dig up the garden so they could tell the social worker they'd done everything they could. Puente consented, even offering them an extra shovel to do so. One of the police officers who worked on the case recalled digging up the garden and discovering pieces of cloth, eggshells, and leather pieces that looked like beef jerky. Sacramento homicide detectives say they are digging up what are, they believe is the remains of at least one body at a location in downtown Sacramento tonight at 1426 F Street. We were just digging and digging, and I could see Dorothea staring out the window at us above. Finally, they discovered the body of 78-year-old Leona Carpenter, and the police realized what they believed was beef jerky was actually human flesh. When confronted by authorities, Puente remained cool and denied everything. The police officer who interviewed her would say, she was emotionless, and she would look straight into my eyes and answer every question. However, the next day, when the police began digging up more portions of the garden, six more remains were discovered in Puente's backyard, including those of 51-year-old Alberto Montoya, 64-year-old Dorothy Miller, 55-year-old Benjamin Fink, 62-year-old James Gallup, 64-year-old Vera Faye Martin, and 78-year-old Betty Palmer. The fifth body from a shallow grave today. Wrapped in a sheet, police couldn't tell if the victim was male or female. The woman believed responsible for the deaths is 71 year old Dorothea Montalvo Puentes, who had a previous record of stealing from the elderly after doping them. Authorities now suspect the woman killed at least five of the tenants and continued to cash their Social Security checks. Later, police discovered her two more killings. One was a 61 year old widow called Ruth Monroe whom Puente convinced to move into her home in April 1982 after her husband died. Another victim was Everson Gilmouth, a 77-year-old retiree who had become Puente's friend while she was in prison. Puente was charged with nine murders and flew back to Sacramento. On her way home, she told reporters that she had not killed anyone, adding, I used to be a very good person at one time. Throughout the trial, Puente was presented as either a loving grandmother figure or a crafty crook who preyed on the vulnerable. Her lawyers said that she may be a thief but not a murderer. Pathologists stated that they had been unable to determine the cause of death for any of the victims. The prosecutor, John O'Mara, put more than 130 witnesses on the stand. The prosecution said Puente used sleeping drugs to sedate her tenants, smothered them, and then paid convicts to bury them in her yard. Puente was described as one of the most cold and calculating female killers the country had ever seen by prosecutors. Dorothea Puente was convicted of three murders and sentenced to life in 1993. Before her murder trials, she was convicted of forgery in 1948 and was sentenced to four months in jail. After her release, she worked as a lady of the night for years before being arrested in 1960 for running a brothel. Then, in 1978, she was accused and convicted of fraudulently cashing 34 state and federal checks owed to her renters. She was given five years of probation and forced to pay $4,000 in restitution. By 1982, Puente had been imprisoned for her theft. She was freed three years later, even though a state psychologist described her as a person with schizophrenia, with no remorse or regret, and who should be closely monitored. She died of natural causes in jail on March 27, 2011, at the age of 82. Youssef is a Dutch expat of Lebanese descent who disguised as a Palestinian marathon runner being sponsored to run the length of Chile. According to Texas Monthly, Youssef was highlighted on the show for his interactions with his roommate, Callie Quinn. She had moved from Texas to Chile in 2011, but after moving in with Youssef, she realized they would not get along. He continuously talked about fleeing and even told Quinn she talked too much. Nevertheless, Quinn and Youssef learned to live together, and he gave her one of the two condominiums he had acquired. Quinn accepted the arrangement. Things started to take a turn for the worst here. After dinner and cocktails, Youssef lured Quinn to a neighboring residence with the promise of discovering and stealing a golden toilet seat. He then struck and strangled her causing a large gash on her head and rendering her unconscious. He immediately went home, claiming to have been out with other friends and persisting he had not seen Quinn. 
Yusef Kotter is a Danish man who was found guilty of attempted murder and fraud in Chile after trying to kill his roommate Callie Quinn in July 2011 and defrauded numerous individuals of thousands of dollars. Youssef, a Danish immigrant of Lebanese ancestry, pretended to be a Palestinian marathon runner and informed his roommates in a Chile-based 12-bedroom hostel that the Federación Palestina de Chile had sponsored him to establish a record by completing the 2,653-mile length of Chile. Carlos Medina and Carlos Kraus, members of the Federación Palestina, had sponsored the 33-year-old to run the event and gave him $8,000. Still, he had to withdraw due to a muscle rupture in his leg, according to the organizers. Youssef stopped responding to calls after physicians checked his leg and discovered no such injury. Quinn survived and made a police report, prompting Youssef to flee his home and go on the lam. When criminal lawyer Rocio Berrios offered to represent Quinn pro bono, she learned about Youssef's defrauding of Medina and Kraus, and the fact that he had borrowed over $50,000 from British runner Dominic Rayner, who had bought him $12,000 in athletic gear and also given him $38,000 to purchase a property jointly. When Rayner met Youssef in Santiago to collect the money, he took him on a climb and attacked him with a walking stick. According to the Texas Monthly piece, Youssef begged him not to tell anyone what had happened, after failing to maim Rayner and leaving him with a shattered head. Rayner later denounced him to the British Metropolitan Police Service and Interpol upon returning to London. Berrios also uncovered that Youssef was detained in Denmark in 2009 for different scams, but failed to appear for trial in January 2011. He was wanted for arson, embezzlement, forgery, and fraud. He had served with the Danish Marines for 10 years until being dishonorably dismissed for fraud at 28. He was ultimately detained in Chile on August 9, when Chilean authorities arranged for a lady to send him a wire transfer and waited for him to meet with the sponsor he had requested to pick it up. While he initially denied being responsible for Quinn's attack, he eventually admitted to bashing her over the head, but stated he had no intention of killing her. A judge found him guilty of attempted murder and sentenced him to 541 days in jail, as well as an additional 61 days for fraud. He had served more than half of them while awaiting trial, and was scheduled to be released in a year before being extradited to Denmark, where he faced five more charges. Youssef was released in Chile and extradited to Denmark, where he was acquitted on three of the five charges against him and was released after three months in jail. According to the Texas Monthly Report, in 2014, he was wanted by authorities in the Costa Rican town of Quepos for allegedly flirting with a Canadian woman and then stealing $19,000 in life savings and attempting to suffocate her with a pillow when she discovered his true identity. He began using the name Joseph Carter and reportedly persuaded businessman Todd Flanders to make a $3,500 order for sportswear while offering to deliver a batch of cheap mobile phones for him to sell, which never materialized. He was questioned by Costa Rico's Organismo de Investigación Judicial, but they found that there was insufficient evidence to indict him. It's disturbing to think that Yusef Cotter hasn't been seen or heard from since 2018. Former lovers and acquaintances have described him as personable, beautiful, and even captivating, making him an unlikely criminal. With little awareness of his background, he may persuade and scam hundreds of people again, as he has done so with few repercussions. The fact that he was only sentenced to 600 days after essentially attempting to kill and bury his roommate alive really is mind-boggling. Since there has been little to no news on Youssef since 2018, the popularity of Netflix's crime docuseries, Worst Roommates Ever, could lead to more sightings of him. He is notorious for evading his crimes and has done an outstanding job of fleeing countries right before being arrested. Maybe someone will recognize Youssef, those he deceived and almost killed will finally receive the justice they deserve, and he won't be able to harm anyone else. Arrest has been made in the murder of a man inside his home in Elkins Park. Today, 64-year-old Harry Bachman was found dead in the basement of his home, and late tonight, police charged his 60-year-old brother with murder. Jameson Bachman spent years as a serial squatter tormenting his housemates and even attempting to drive them out of their own houses before killing his brother. Jameson Bachman appeared to be financially secure and trustworthy. He was personable, had a law degree, and those who knew him professionally had only good things to say about him. But Bachman harbored a secret. He was a serial squatter. He was a clever man with his law school degrees and excellent understanding of residence regulations. Bachman saw no need to pay rent. Instead, he would prevent eviction by using legal loopholes even removing his housemates from their homes. One of Jameson Bachman's childhood classmates allegedly called him 
the cockiest kid you've ever met. He excelled at practically everything he attempted, and his parents believed he could do no wrong, according to New York Magazine. Bachman's high school yearbook comment, Fools say they learn by experience, foreshadowed what would come for him. I like to profit from other people's experiences. He finally received a master's degree in history from Georgetown University, where he was regarded as a remarkable student with extraordinary talents, according to New York Magazine. One Georgetown professor stated, In 20 years of university teaching, I have encountered very few people of his caliber. After graduation, Bachman spent many years in Israel and the Netherlands. He finally returned to the United States and received his law degree from the University of Miami at the age of 45. Bachman, however, has yet to become a practicing attorney since he failed the bar test on his first attempt in 2003 and never attempted again. However, Jameson Bachman quickly began to apply his legal skills differently. In 2017, a 31-year-old woman named Alex Miller listed her extra bedroom on Craigslist. Two weeks later, she received an offer from a man named Jed Creek, who she subsequently learned was Jameson Bachman. Creek claimed to be a lawyer and informed her that he wanted to locate a place because his family who lived nearby were unwell and he needed to care for them. Creek sent Miller a $800 check after they agreed to live together. Miller was unconcerned by the check's lack of an address, which cleared the next day. The duo settled into a rhythm of living together, with Creek getting up early to exercise his dog, but things quickly began to go downhill. When Alex requested him to pay $140 for his portion of the utility bills, Creek claimed the money was for the period before he moved in. When she pressed him for payment, he texted her, We can handle this in court if you prefer. When Miller returned home one day, Creek had removed all light bulbs from the shared living room for his lights and repurposed the six dining room seats into a workstation. Creek would use reasons like a filthy dish left out or a cigarette butt in the toilet to avoid paying his rent, claiming that they violated the warranty of habitability. Alex's mother became skeptical about Creek and started to search for him online, only to discover his true identity and numerous stories, one of which said that he attempted to evict a woman called Melissa Frost from her house in New York during Hurricane Sandy. After learning his actual name from her mother, Alex wrote Creek a letter notifying him that the authorities had been informed of his activities and that he needed to leave. He ultimately departed but not before putting cat litter into the toilet. Later in the day, he returned to the property and assaulted Alex. Alex contacted the police, and Jameson was arrested and charged with aggravated assault. When he departed, she discovered a package of ammunition and a cleaning kit for a 38 caliber handgun in his luggage. Jameson was bailed out of jail by his older brother Harry. Jameson Bachman was released from prison on June 17, 2017. However, his freedom would not last long. Just weeks later, he met Miller at a nearby police station to recover the items he'd left in her home. While there, he said, you're dead. Miller immediately reported him, and he was quickly arrested again. Harry bailed him out again, but his wife refused to let Bachman remain at their house. This enraged Jameson, and he ultimately took it out on his brother. On November 3, 2017, Jameson Bachman violently beat Harry to death, grabbed his credit card, and left in his car. When Harry failed to meet his wife out of town as agreed that evening, she called the police who discovered Harry's body at the foot of the basement steps. Police say they were called around 12.15 Saturday afternoon to this home on the 400 block of North Sterling Road in Elkins Park. The call was for a welfare check after the victim, Harry Bachman, didn't show up to meet a relative the night before. When police arrived, they say they found Harry Bachman dead in the basement. They also found signs of a violent struggle and blunt force trauma to the victim's head and body. Police say the suspect, Bachman's brother, Jameson, stole Bachman's car, a red Ford Escape from the driveway. Detectives found that vehicle at the Fairfield Inn Hotel in Upper Moreland Township and then took the suspect into custody. The police have not released a motive for the killing. Authorities say Jameson Bachman will be charged with first and third degree murder. According to Radio Times, officers instantly began looking for Bachman and discovered him in a hotel room barely seven miles away. He returned to prison to await trial for his brother's murder. However, Bachman would never make it to trial. He took his life in his prison cell on December 8, 2017. The worst roommate ever's reign of terror was over, but he had damaged countless lives. If you have made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate all of you. If you're interested in these stories and crave more, then check out the other stories on the channel. If you have a topic suggestion, please send it to the email in the description. As always, remember to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. Until next time, keep your eyes open and stay curious.